among the driving forces for future foods is going to be health. Food companies are under mounting pressure to design processed products with improved nutrient profiles. That is clearly important for commercial purposes for the future of products and brands, but much more than that. Food technology and food science is crucial for the future health of humankind. I'm not saying that to be flattering to an audience. It's a hard-headed assessment of the best way forward for public health. A couple reasons. Manufactured foods provide most of the intake in most developed societies. And hence, the nutrient profiles of manufactured products shape the nutritional status of nations. They would be a logical focus of attention even in the best of circumstances. But many of these products, of course, also have poor nutrient profiles that contribute to obesity, uh, non-communicable diseases, especially diabetes, and as we just heard, to mental health problems as well. But there is a second reason for focusing on food technology and reformulation, which is much less popular. <coughs> Namely, virtually all the other traditional nutritional policies have failed. If you look at the traditional remedies in public health, taxation, regulation, and education have been the mainstays. And they've had successes in many areas but not with food. Taxing bad foods, often these days sugar and soft drinks are a popular option, is a common proposal modeled on the success of taxation of tobacco control. But there are many problems in taxing foods, but the main one, which I'm have available today, is the politics of food taxation. If you look at food taxes from a poli politician's perspective, they're a very unattractive proposition. Raising taxes is never popular, particularly in the middle of a recession. But <coughs> any British politician will remember that only two years ago, in 2012, a very modest increase in the VAT rate on Cornish pasties produced a consumer result that made the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer back down. But the big event in the taxation debate is what's happened in Denmark, one of the more tax-tolerant nations in the, on the planet, which tried to introduce a fat tax and repealed it after one year of ineffectiveness and almost universal opposition. After those experiences, no elected democratic politician is likely to tax food taxation in, the, in Europe in the near future. If you look at regulation, there are many proposals to control the composition of food and their nutrient profiles. And this is a very plausible approach. After all, the greatest success in food policy that we have ever had was the control of adulteration in foods through 19th century laws. But much has changed since then. Now, regulation is not commonly seen as a form of consumer protection, but rather as a burden on business. So we favor light touch regulation, which means fewer rules, not more. The consequence is, that as a practical matter, the regulation of food composition is not a serious option in the immediate future. We've had three global surveys of nutrition policies around the world in the last decade, all of them have come to the same conclusion. Nutrition policy in almost any country, developing or developed, means always the same thing. It means education for consumers. It's been the overwhelming choice everywhere. It means an exhortation to choose different foods and giving people the facts on which to make so-called informed, healthy choices. This is, in my, the jargon of my trade, a behavioral change strategy. We can't get people to change their behavior in regard to foods. 
these education strategies have failed. Full stop, no qualification. They appeal to a minority of people who actually change their diet. Sometimes when you have intensive pilot projects on a small scale, they can be very effective. But if you look globally, they are a failure. And the evidence of that is an obesity epidemic all over the world in poor countries as well as rich ones, leading on to a diabetes epidemic. We must be doing something wrong. If you look in summary then about the traditional remedies of, of public health, nothing has worked. None of the traditional public health remedies. All are unacceptable, ineffective, or both. So what do we do instead? If people are unwilling or unable to change their foods, then let us start with the foods that they eat now and improve their nutrient profiles. That is a strategy of nutritional reformulation. It's the best option we have available to us at present. It has a number of consequences. One is the positive one. Why I say that food scientists and food technologists are central to the future health of humankind. But nutrition policy is also rare. Among, uh, nutritional reformulation is rare among nutrition policies because it improves the bottom line as well as improving public health. In the often rancorous debates about food and health, industry says that it wants to be part of the solution as well as part of the problem. Well, this is how you do it. You improve the nutrient profiles of mass market foods. Many of you in this room will be involved in new product development, and this is potentially very important. But, as we will all know, we heard, 14,000 a year that come onto the, the market, most of them fail, and the ones that succeed remain for the most part niche products. New product development is not a medium term public health solution. But if you turn, if you want improvement on a global scale, then you need to reformulate foods that are eaten by billions not by the concerned few. That means you have to reformulate popular mass market foods. That means you have to improve the nutrient profile of the existing leading brands. There is a nutritional truism in my trade. Food that is not eaten provides no nutritional value. The implication of that for the argument I'm making is that if nutritional reformulation is going to deliver benefits on a public health scale, then the reformulated products have to be successful. They have to be consumed. They have to sell. How do you go about reformulation? Well, let's start with the basics. You can do it in the field or in the factory. Improving the nutrient profiles of crops or livestock is one approach. It's crucial for developing countries, but also for developed. One of the major long-term projects supported by the European uh, framework has been the attempt to pro provide a crop-based source of DHA and EPA that we were talking about. We've run through linseed, rapeseed, we're now into Camilla. We're desperately trying to get a crop-based source of DHA for food manufacturers to use and fish farmers. But most of the attention is these days devoted to reformulation in factory, that's to say reformulating products. And at the simplest level, you can take something out or you can put something in. The most emphasis these days is on reducing the excessive ingredients, fat, sugar, and salt, but also the ingredients that cause allergies or intolerances, with the hot number these days being gluten. But we also have 
deficiencies in developed societies. And the last speaker gave us a long list of deficiencies in the diet that affect our mental health. We could be adding a lot of things to uh, our foods. And it's not just our brains, but one of the big issues is Britain's problems with its bones. That's to say, the reappearance of rickets through a shortage of vitamin D, or increasing osteoporosis in women, a shortage of calcium. There's a lot of scope for traditional reformulation as well as reductions. But if we do come to reduction, which is the, the main source of evidence, as our first speaker mentioned to us, we have three basic options available to us. One is dehabituation, which is to say simply use less and gradually dehabituate people's taste preferences. And this is the strategy that has underlain the, the most successful nutrition policy in the UK since the Second World War, which is the UK salt reduction program. Reduce salt, have salt intake 15% in the first six years. But you can also do it through various technologies, about which everyone in the room knows more than I do, and will perform the rest of the conference. But I would draw attention to two products, which are particularly significant from a nutritional point of view, and which nutritionists are very reluctant often to acknowledge, namely baked chips and baked crisps, two very unpopular products with nutritionists, but we have versions on the market with 70% less fat than the traditional ones. And what's also significant about this is that those astounding reductions have both been made through changes in process technology, not in new ingredients. But if we turn to substitute ingredients as a third route, they have a variable record of both use and controversy, but there are many new developments underway. In the UK, the use of sweeteners in place of sugar is the, the major one that's been developed on a limited scale. But there are a lot of new developments on that, including new so-called natural sweeteners. With salt, salt substitutes have been very important in salt reduction in both Finland and Iceland, but not in the UK, but that may be changing. We do have new nanotechnology, micronized salt <coughs> is one example, but also we may have a change in policy on potassium sulfate substitutes as well. Fat substitute ingredients have not been successful in most places directly, but there have been a lot of fat mimetics already in use in the formulation. go about uh, reformulation. One is the slow route uh, with incremental reductions. There are many anecdotes of failed products, low salt products, low fat products, which are perceived by consumers to have been tasteless. The point being of this strategy is you've got to carry consumers with you, particularly established consumers. And the incremental approach, gradual, has been behind the success of the SALT program. But it's also been the approach developed by many individual companies in reformulations that are not widely recognized because they don't make a lot of noise about them. But you can also proceed quickly, and there's good reason for doing that. Namely, we have an epidemic of diabetes on the way. And if the current pattern forms, which is to say an increasing percentage of the population has type 2 diabetes, and onset increasingly begins at an earlier age, so you're treating people for life, then diabetes on that scale would break the bank of any healthcare system in the world, no matter how it is funded. We've got to do something, and this lends an urgency to nutritional reformulation as a nutrition policy. <coughs> Who does it? Individual companies can do it. 
Heinz has been reformulating for salt and sugar since the mid-1980s, transformed to of its products. Nestle and Unilever both have published programs for nutritional reformulation of their whole range of products on all nutritional variables. Many other individual companies are doing it, but they keep quiet about the changes, so we don't know how much is going on. You can also do it collectively, that's to say, by organizing the companies in product sector groups so that they agree common targets and timetables for nutritional reformulation. The point of this has been to control any potential competitive risk. Many people perceive that a low salt product would be a risky product, perceived to be tasteless. By reducing salt together in the UK salt program, you were attempting to control the competitive risk that was there. That was a project organized by the government, but there have been similar ones organized by the industry project Neptune, for example, by the soup and sauce manufacturers. There's also a combination arrangement. The Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation in the United States was an alliance of 17 major food manufacturers who provide about 25% of the calories in the UK. They agreed on calorie reduction as a strategy, but without specific targets for specific categories. But in the first five years, they managed to take 6.4 trillion calories out of the American diet. <clears throat> How much do you reformulate? Well, as always, as we've heard, you do sensory testing beforehand, usually for is it acceptable, or is it preferable, sensory test against some sort of benchmark competitive product. But with nutritional reformulation, you're doing an additional form of sensory testing. It's what I call threshold of recognition testing. That is to say, can established users of the product recognize the difference between the new reformulated version and the existing product? And the point of this strategy is to make your reductions, your reformulations, just below the threshold of recognition so that the change is imperceptible to your established customers. And this is particularly important when your strategy involves existing leading brands. You have to carry the consumers with them. You can't have a shock to their established preferences. But there is a second issue about how much, which is to say, to claim or not to claim, should we put a claim on a reformulated product. And the industry is very much strongly divided on this. The pro argument is, what is the point of investing all the time, money, and effort in reformulated products if I cannot make a claim about the unique selling point that emerges? And these are the people who are in continuing arguments with the European Food Safety Authority and Pop Farm about what claims they can make of health. Article 13, Article 14 of the law. But there is another sector also in the industry which says, no, we're not going to make claims. We recognize that many healthy products have failed or remain niche products, and so we will make no claims about them whatsoever. And indeed, 90% of the program products, more than 90% of products in the UK salt program, make no claims about low or reduced salt at all. Underlying that second strategy is a very hard truth. A hard truth particularly for nutritionists to recognize, but also for some in the industry. And it is this. Many consumers are simply not interested in healthy food. <laughs> some of them are even worth telling by. Who the hell are you to tell me what to eat? Keeping silent about it is one way to deal with This is what I call the unobtrusive strategy. If we proceed incrementally without the changes being perceptible to established customers, and they do it invisibly as well. And this has a number of consequences, some of which are not so pleasant. Namely, companies receive no credit for the changes that they make. Indeed, sometimes they get abused for doing nothing at all because they're not making a lot of noise about it. 
second consequence is more serious, which is nobody knows how much nutritional reformulation is underway. I don't know. Nobody even in the industry knows. The Food and Drink Federation, who I've asked many times about the extent of it, doesn't know and doesn't even want to take on the research to find out. And it's a serious problem if you do it that way. But the one thing we certainly know is there's more of the way than meets the eye. And this is important because it helps sell products, which is necessary to improve public health. To conclude, nutritional reformulation is the best option we have available to us for dealing with the multiple dietary problems which afflict the world. It has some unique attributes and advantages which are worth bearing in mind. Advantages not only for public health, but also for the industry. The first is, there is no need for people to continuously choose healthy food every time they go to a shop, every time they go into their own kitchen. You don't have to be looking at labels and consciously seeking out the better product. Doing it this way then benefits everyone, not just the health conscious, the health aware. It even benefits those who hate healthy eating. But the most important that is that this is a strategy for nutrition improvement without <coughs> change. And this has certain implications that also benefit for the industry. It's nutritional improvement without changing products, without changing brands. Okay. I'd like to thank Jack for that impressive uh, presentation on suggesting perhaps health by stealth, which is, I think, where you're out with me this afternoon. We'll uh, give some clues as to how that might be achieved. Can I correct you, Jack? Certainly do. <laughs> Never, ever use the word stealth. Sorry. <laughs> stealth implies something true. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm suggesting, and the whole point of this speech, is this is a very positive strategy, and it's something of which the industry can be proud and find more, <coughs> more positive. <laughs> not <done> myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yes, can we take a couple of questions? <coughs> because students of exercise and nutrition uh, recognize exercise and nutrition and that exercise has a great impact, maybe even bigger, on non-communicable uh, diseases. And <coughs> would you uh, have an idea how to actually make people do exercise uh, based <laughs> on uh, the strategy for food? Uh. Uh, it's interesting you say that. I, spent, I was at a, a meeting in the House of Lords <coughs> last night where it was hammer and palm between those say it's calories and the others who say it's activity, right? Yeah. Well, clearly, it's some part of both. But I, I declare my patch to be the food bit, not the activity. Okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a sensory scientist, but I've also got a vested interest in the, the diabetes side and the obesity obviously, epidemic that's, uh, if not here, is up and coming. Um, I'd like to say that obviously if, if companies aren't able or allowed to shout about the formulations in terms of producing salt and sugar, perhaps another way around it is to associate themselves with other uh, organisations or charity partnerships. Um, I'll use the example of Tesco as the charity partner of Diabetes UK, which is the leading charity. And that's actually been very successful in raising money for diabetes in the UK. But obviously, it looks, it shows Tesco in a very positive light as well. So they're concerned about it, it, it does. Uh, uh, I cut out uh, a long introduction about uh, the war between public health people and the food industry. But anticipating what you might say, I put this on the end, right? Uh, Margaret Chan came out, uh, the Director General of um, the uh, World Health Organization, with the most extreme version of the war 
between public health and food that I have ever encountered. And this is what she said. Uh, uh, you are the enemy. Now, there is a whole sector of the public health world who agrees with Margaret Chan. They don't say it's a public thing. And hence, in the kind of world that I move in, I mean, in organization after organization that has anguished debates about who can we take money from, who can we associate with that might be respectable. And sometimes it used to come down to mineral water companies, but not even they are acceptable these days. Yes, you're absolutely right. You can make alliances. But there are a lot of people, and Margaret Chan is one of them, who wouldn't make alliance with you. And so it's, it's, um, there's a difficulty of even trying to do good in, in the current state of antagonism that sometimes exists between people in public health and the food industry. And if you do do it, it has to be done with some subtlety uh, 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 so that it doesn't look like trying to put a gloss of respectability on what is a blatantly commercial product, as for instance, Cadbury did. They tried to give away sports equipment and you had to eat yourself fat in order to get football. Um, so there are complications, but it's, you're right, it's, it's a route, but given the cast of mind of many people in the nutritional world, it's not always an easy route. Okay. Uh, can I just say the, the ad? Should any, <laughs> if you want, anyone wants to follow up on my ideas, this will be on the slide. Uh, 